So in today's video, I just want to very briefly talk about atrial fibrillation. So the definition of atrial fibrillation is where we have disorganized, rapid and very irregular atrial contraction. So what this means is if we look at the structure of the heart here, we have two atria and two ventricles. Normally, we have the sinoatrial node here, which is initiating an electrical current and it's going to spread throughout the atria and it's going to spread very evenly and then the atria are going to contract. Then we have an electric signal from the atrioventricular node and eventually this is going to spread to the ventricles and the ventricles are going to contract. So in cases of atrial fibrillation, this electrical impulse is very sporadic and it's very disorganized and it's very rapid and it's stronger in some areas and it's not as strong in other areas. So the overall effect is a very irregular and very disorganized atrial contraction. So that is the summary of atrial fibrillation. Now we need to think why this is detrimental to the body. So if we have this abnormal atrial contraction, this is going to affect the amount of blood which is going into the ventricles and then into the aorta or the pulmonary circulation. So it's going to affect the amount of blood which is leaving the heart, basically. The effect, obviously, if the atria aren't contracting properly and there's less blood going into the ventricles and less blood going elsewhere in the body, this means other tissues aren't going to get as much oxygen. So with atrial fibrillation, the patient is at risk of dementia, most likely due to ischemia or lack of oxygen, stroke, and even a myocardial infarction, which is where the heart muscles themselves are not getting enough oxygen. So something else I'd like to talk about is the risk factors of atrial fibrillation. So it's usually more common in men and people who are above 60 years of age. The risk factors involve people who already have high blood pressure or hypertension, people who have diabetes mellitus, and people who have sleep apnea. Atrial fibrillation can also occur alongside other diseases, so it can happen alongside hypothyroidism or acute alcohol intoxication, or it can happen during a myocardial infarction. It's one of the symptoms of a myocardial infarction that the patient is having uh, pulse palpations and atrial fibrillation. So now I want to talk about the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. So in some cases it can actually be asymptomatic, so the patient isn't actually aware that they're having an episode. Another symptom can be pulse palpitations, so the pulse is very randomized. The patient may also experience fainting and lightheadedness. There may also be shortness of breath and it could even result in chest pain. Now, with atrial fibrillation, we usually have elevation of the heart rate, so the beats per minute is usually between 120 to 160, but it's not totally impossible for it to exceed this number as well. So in some cases, uh, the heart rate is even elevated to about 180 to 200 beats per minute. That's also possible. The diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is done on an ECG, so I'll show you a normal ECG and one which is where the patient has atrial fibrillation. You can see the main difference is that the P wave is all over the place with atrial fibrillation and we can see the difference between the R wave intervals, they're completely random, there's, there's no set distance like there is in the normal ECG. And finally I just want to talk about the types of atrial fibrillation. So we have paroxysmal which is uh, very short acting episodes so it will start and stop randomly. We have persistent atrial fibrillation, which has a longer duration, so it's lasting over seven days. And we have long-standing, persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation, which is occurring for more than a year at a time. So I'll make a separate video on the treatment of atrial fibrillation, but that's all I want to discuss in today's video. And thank you for watching.